So I want to introduce my guests this morning. Uh, so sitting to my right is uh, Lieutenant Governor Kulanakis. Kunalakis. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay, Kunalakis. And she was uh, sworn in as the 50th Lieutenant Governor of California and is the first woman elected Lieutenant Governor of California. So we're very proud of that. <laughs> In 2019, she was, uh, the Lieutenant Governor was designated as the Governor's Representative for International Affairs and Trade Development and as Chair of the Corresponding Interagency Committee that oversees the state's trade investment and international relations. She is also the Chair of the Three Member State Lands Commission. From 2010 to 2013, she served as President Barack Obama's ambassador to the Republic of Hungary and was the first Greek American woman at age 43, one of the America's youngest to serve as US ambassador. And Lieutenant Governor Kulanakis led the California's delegation to the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26 in Glasgow, on behalf of California Governor Gavin Newsom. Nice to have you with us. And joining us um, from uh, is Lieutenant Governor Tenorio. Uh, did I say that right, Tenorio? You got it. Okay, great. The Honorable Joshua Franque Franquez Tenorio is the 10th elected Lieutenant Governor of Guam. He's the first LGBTQ person to be elected Lieutenant Governor in the United States, and he. <laughs> And he advocates for LGBTQ plus rights and inclusion and is a founding member of the nonprofit Equality Guam. Since taking office in January 2019, Lieutenant Governor Tenorio has spearheaded efforts that embrace sustain sustainable development and has worked tirelessly to expand youth programs and opportunities, reduce homelessness and poverty, expand drug and alcohol treatment programs, and improve the juvenile justice and child welfare systems. He is the chairman of the Islandwide Beautification Task Force, the Interagency Council on Home Homelessness, the Guam Hazard Mitigation Committee, and the Guam Product Seal Task Force. He is also the co-chairman of the Guam Green Growth Steering Committee and has oversight over the Guam State Clearing House, House charged with monitoring federal grant expenditures and programs. We'll talk about that a little bit more because that's a very important part of the, uh, the future of uh, climate implementation. And he certainly, he currently serves on the Global Island Partnership Board of Directors, which is an international organization whose mission is to build resilient and sustainable island communities. His many awards and honors include the 2021 NLGA Energy and Environmental Stewardship Award presented in partnership with the National Lieutenant Governors Association and Baker's Hughes. So both these lieutenant governors have are breaking ceilings, they're doing so much work across uh, all sorts of sectors and important areas that we need to move the needle on, but we're gonna focus on, uh, on climate today and the transition to a green economy. So my first question to both of you, and I'll start with you, Madam Lieutenant Governor, is what are your jurisdictions, so the state of California's main priorities and challenges in making the transition to the green economy? So Amy, I'm gonna start by jumping out of my chair the way uh, that Jerry Brown did <laughs> when he was with Governor Inslee and Governor Inslee uh, suggested in front of Jerry Brown that Washington was surpassing certain goals of California. Uh -oh. I just have to stand up. <laughs> Welcome all of you to California who are from out of state. Thank all of you who are living in California, recognize that the, uh, that the Climate Registry itself was founded here in California. And remember that by comparison, Washington State is about a half a trillion dollar economy. The economy of California is about three and a half trillion dollar economy. There are eight million people almost up in Washington State 50 million people almost in the state of California. And by all accounts, 
California is the engine that is driving the transition to a carbon-free energy future and combating climate change. <laughs> California is doing it. OK. All right. Now I'll sit down. I had to just had to get that out of my system. OK, so what is California doing? What are our main goals and what are our main concerns? Uh, our main uh, goals are getting to our 2045 goals. Uh, we were among the first in the world to set the ambitious goal of that by 2045, we would be carbon neutral and have a 100% uh, carbon free uh, electric grid. Uh, what beyond that you might not know, but you should, is that in 2022, CARB released the scoping plan. The scoping plan is now the statutory roadmap of requirements to get us to 2045. So for instance, 2045, we have to be 100 free, 100% 100 uh, clean energy grid, but by 2035, we've gotta be 90% there, right? So this is really ambitious. This roadmap, this scoping plan sets the standards for the goals that we need to make as we get to the 2045 goals. Some of the challenges to do that, a lot of challenges. We have a plan to build five gigawatts of offshore wind off of our coast. A lot of work being done. It has to be floating offshore wind turbines. Our goal is five gigawatts. There's only a half a, giga, a, 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 half a gigawatt of offshore wind currently that's floating, that's already been constructed. So this is definitely, uh, we're at the, the, the front lines of, of offshore wind, floating offshore wind. Uh, we also have to massively ramp up the amount of electricity that we produce. By the middle of the century, uh, we have to have about three times the amount of electricity that is, um, uh, that is uh, uh, produced. So uh, a lot of work is going to have to go into getting there. But as I think we're going to talk about, California has also allocated enormous resources in order to be able to do that. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Happy always in any uh, setting like this as we were together in COP26 to represent the state of California. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Tenorio, same question. Challenges and opportunities in the transition to the green economy. So you know, um, I come from one of the regions where uh, climate change and global warming and sea level rise, it is the existential threat to the survival of all Pacific Islanders. Of course, there are other Islanders abroad, uh, elsewhere in the, in the world, but uh, we're seeing it firsthand. Uh, and I come from an island where our civilization dates back 4,000 years ago. So resilience, uh, sustainability, it's in our DNA. Uh, and so why wouldn't we try to push back uh, on certain things that are uh, bad about the island? 90% of things that are imported from abroad move away from an agrarian economy to one that's uh, dominated by military spending and tourism. There's a lot of things that can um, be challenges in this space. So, uh, and then, of course, being a U.S. territory and having this, being in this precarious situation, which there shouldn't be, um, and dealing with four years of an administration whose values weren't similar with ours, um, weren't looking at um, the planet and weren't concerned about the health of everybody. I mean, this is a challenge that all of us, and by the way, we can't foresee the future, but we're not yet out of the woodwork, if you know what I mean. So let me first say thank you to the innovators and the change makers here that are working very rapidly to help and to do their effort. And so for us, what we did was we decided to adopt all of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we adopted them as a government. We created the Guam Green Growth uh, to establish action areas to coordinate work that's already being done uh, and to identify areas that are high risk that are either unfunded or there's no forward movement that um, is being seen and focusing government resources uh, civil society and the private sector to try and address things on the front line, right? We're the ones that are going to that are seeing uh, um, the coral reef ble the coral reef bleaching. We're the ones uh, that are seeing erosion and the loss of land. We're the ones that are probably going to be the first step 
for the first climate refugees from the rest of Micronesia that are living in atolls that are going to be lost um, if we don't rapidly take action. And I think that one thing I wanted to say when I was listening to a, a bunch of the speakers, you have to be able to act in any space you're at. So um, the ability for the developing world or for the donor countries to move is one thing, but I might want to tell you a, dir a dirty little secret. Most of the uh, small island states who um, are receiving pledges from donor countries in the billions and billions of dollars don't have access to the funds. Um, somebody said that it takes two years in order to get something. That's pretty um, ambitious, actually. Uh, the reality is that these systems that are set up, um, the small islands don't have the capacity or the manpower to access. So what I wanted to say is, for those of you that are in private sectors or in uh, partnerships that are innovators, the fastest way you can help the islands is to innovate and bring the innovations to the islands and not wait, as uh, Governor Inslee said, for the nation to open the, the channel. They're not going to be able to move as rapid as people in local governments or state governments or territorial governments, or for that matter, even faster for the private sector. That's a really interesting point. And yes. So innovation, as Governor Inslee said, and you just uh, stated, is so important to uh, moving on climate action. And uh, one of the things that we've talked about a lot this week already, and more so this after or later this morning, is that for the first time in our nation's history, the federal government has made it a goal that 40% of overall benefits of certain federal investments flow to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by population. So uh, there probably are some challenges in terms of implementing that goal in order to access those investments. Um, and so I'm interested in hearing about that. And also, for your respective jurisdictions, what, um, what are the most pressing environmental justice issues you are facing, and what actions are you trying to take to address those? Um, so we're thrilled that the federal government has set this goal. California set a goal many years ago that for our cap and trade program, 35% of the funds generated off of cap and trade would go for um, underserved communities. The reality is that about 50% of those funds are going into underserved communities. So, uh, so I'm very optimistic that federal funds will also be able to use in that. It's not that hard. We know how to direct funds uh, in that way. Uh, they are largely about um, recognizing that certain areas uh, suffer more from pollution than others. Uh, there's um, also the reality that when it comes to accessing funds, whether it's through rebate programs um, or other kinds of programs, if it requires a capital investment, um, that it's more likely that people who... <laughs> ah. Okay. Yeah. What is it? Do you think? The, we found out the first morning that the um, fire alarm is connected to, for the hotel is connected to the whole mall. And so sometimes okay. things will happen at a restaurant, but they should be coming on with an announcement. just say I think that's perfectly appropriate there is an alarm that is being sounded in the world right now and we are answering the alarm by being here we're not going to disregard the alarm we are going to rise up and address it so okay <laughs> all right so I'm um, going back to the question of environmental justice it's basically you have our attention Okay. 
Let's see if that's the end of it. That's okay, we've got a minute here. Yeah. I think it's it's done. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, the floor. <laughs> um, pollution, accessing the programs um, for people who don't necessarily have capital outlay, like for a new car, um, and uh, uh, and making sure that the jobs in the new economy that we are investing in are accessible and available to people in underserved communities or traditionally underrepresented communities. So in the first area relative to pollution, this is why the transition to zero emission vehicles is so incredibly important. Uh, you know that Governor Newsom announced his 2035 goal that um, by 2035, all new cars sold in California will be zero emission vehicles. This has set off a huge race to meet this market, which is really exciting. Um, because what we know is that uh, pollution comes, half of our greenhouse gas emissions in California come from um, transportation, from cars, from heavy duty trucks, and from the uh, refinement of oil in order to, to power those. So when we look, if you look at any map and you look at the, the areas that have the most congestion on the road, you look at the areas that are the main roadways for truck traffic, those are largely through these, um, these communities um, that we're trying to target for, for EJ. So that's also the, the clean truck uh, plan um, is very aggressive in our state. We've gotten a lot of pushback. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I hope you followed along with the... <laughs> So I just, this is such an important issue. I don't want to lose the thread of it for you. I don't want to lose, and I'm sorry now my time has been expanded no, a little yeah. bit on this, but it's, it's very important. And the state of California is looking at everything through um, the lens of equity. So in this effort, reducing pollution, getting the trucks, cleaned up, getting our ports cleaned up, um, getting uh, access to the kinds of programs, again, like rebates. So not just if you buy a new car do you get a car rebate. If you buy a used car, you can have access. If it's an EV, you can have access to a rebate. And then, of course, as we program where all of the grant money that we have had um, largely through two years of surpluses, but also through federal funds, making sure that that's benefiting these communities. And again, based on our cap and trade program, we know how to do it. We know that it can be done. Um, again, the size of the last two years of surplus in California have been extraordinary. Uh, there are budget announcements today talking about needing to um, make up a deficit but even with the deficit, the size of our budgets has grown significantly since, um, the, uh, uh, since um, the Newsom administration came in. And there's about $48 billion of new funds that are targeted, $48 billion of new funds over the last two, now two and a half years, targeted toward transitioning to a clean energy future and combating climate change. And we are laser focused on making sure these funds get into the communities that have traditionally been ignored or left behind. Thank you. Wonderful. I'll, Thank I'll just you. add mm -hmm. that, um, you know, for the territories, um, the application of Justice 40 is coming in with some problems. Uh, we have national labs that are coming up with maps that are based on data that either don't exist or are insufficient for the mapping that is coming out. And so there's an active uh, uh, movement among all of the U.S. territories to push back uh, and make sure that um, the true uh, situation in each of the different jurisdictions is going to be recognized and they're not going to be pockets of populations that are going to be pushed out because of um, this mistake. 
But uh, with regards to issues on Guam, um, you know, we have an island where uh, the bulk of the population lives over an aquifer. That is the, that is the dominant water source for the island. Um, and there are a whole bunch of people that don't have access to wastewater. And so uh, we see, and we did see in COVID-19, that um, there was a disproportionate um, effect of COVID-19 in populations that don't have proper sanitation, uh, running water, uh, wastewater. Uh, and so uh, the federal funds that uh, we see coming down the pike are going to be focused on bringing those communities, mostly migrant communities from other islands in our region, uh, and to bring them into uh, modern times and give them what they need to have a chance at having uh, a good quality of life. That's a very basic thing. But uh, because we have such a big impact, both from mass tourism and from military operations, the other, um, uh, the other issues we have have to do with uh, the remnants of uh, big military industrial activities um, that happened. Our island, by the way, was uh, occupied for two and a half years in World War II, and still we find unexploded ordinances around town as part of our development. And now, as Guam resurfaces as an epicenter in the uh, in this new um, geopolitical competition with China, we're seeing now an, uh, an in, uh, another expansion of military, having a missile defense system now that's going to be rapidly deployed on the island, and now push, pushing our government to make sure we need to understand about radars uh, and all of the environmental uh, challenges that are going to affect land use and things like that. Um, but. Uh, not everything is bleak, right? I want to just take a little time to focus on some of the great stuff that we're doing. Um, using, uh, I want to thank uh, the Ames Laboratory of NASA for developing an awesome program that is uh, taking regular uh, digital photographs to map our entire coral reef system so that we understand exactly the extent of the bleaching uh, that we're able to dispatch response so that we can go ahead and, um, and empower people to make that difference. And Dr. Shelton, who you heard from a couple of days ago, um, is in the forefront, uh, empowering a whole bunch of young people that are like-minded and that are focused on, um, on all of these uh, environmental causes and activating them, not only into the economy, but also acting, activating them into the workforce so that we can expand the number of folks that are out there to do these interventions. Right, because the intervention work that is needed right now is so great. Uh, and I, I would say that this is where we're going to see a lot of return on this investment. And I'd like to follow up on that question. You talked about the partnership with NASA, and we do need a all of society approach to, to, tackle, to tackle this problem of uh, climate change. And even though there is this funding um, available from the federal government, uh, public-private partnerships and financing has always been a part of the solution. And so I'd like to ask you, and then, and then Madam Lieutenant Governor, um, how do you see uh, public-private partnerships or financing fitting into your climate strategy? So let me um, just bookmark this first. Um, the Probably um, the best partner so far, or one of the most effective partners that we have, um, has been the Department of Defense. Now, there's... It's sort of a mixed bag, but the reason why I say that is, had it not been from a depart for a Department of Defense policy mandating that bases operate, uh, and this is about 10 years ago, 25% renewable energy, it wouldn't have motivated or mandated the public utility to start moving in this direction. For a long time, they were very resistant uh, to doing anything other than burning this really, really bad uh, fossil fuel uh, and then now making leaps. So in Guam, we have adopted or we have mandated by law 100% renewable by 2045, 50% by 2035, but we're going to meet the 50% by 2030. Uh, and so we're rapidly moving. And in some ways, um, some of this is enabled by direct investment by the Department of Defense as part of their programming. But uh, back to your question. Um, I think that uh, creating uh, financing options and establishing 
public-private partnerships and bringing in the investment is something that we're used to doing in developing and expanding our infrastructure already. So applying that to the space of, of uh, moving forward into all of these different kinds of things is not going to be anything unusual. It would be par for the course. Okay, thank you. Um, so public-private partnerships in getting to our 2045 goals um, are, they, they are inextric inextricably linked to um, government leadership. Um, we set the goals, we set the mandates, we set the regulation, we provide uh, grant money, we provide tax credits, we are the largest consumer market in the United States, but ultimately it is the private sector that sees the opportunity, organizes their companies around meeting the market in a way that they can make the bottom line work. Uh, that's just how it works. And so I always go to what I think is probably the best example of how public-private partnerships have worked in helping to advance our goals and frankly lead in the world, and that's Tesla. And I always uh, joke uh, that, um, you know, Tesla could not have uh, been founded and achieved the success that it has anywhere else in the world. Uh, we um, provided about $3.2 billion in grant money, tax credit money, and rebates for Tesla. $3.2 billion of taxpayer dollars for Tesla to be able to be founded, grow, and thrive. And uh, no, I always joke that um, Elon Musk is not very grateful. <laughs> But we weren't looking for gratitude. We were looking for transformation. And guess what? Thanks to the vision of the state, the courage of the political leadership, and the taxpayer-funded programs, we got it. Because by all accounts, what Tesla did in the car market is really why we have the opportunity to set a goal that by 2035, um, all new cars will be ZEVs. Uh, and, and we've already, you know, the goals that we've set for the number of cars, EVs sold in California, we've blown past the, the goals. It's more than a million, is that right, Matt? We, we just uh, exceeded a million EVs sold. So that's the formula. And uh, I think that when we look at I mean, everything, I mentioned offshore wind. These are private companies that are going to build it. Uh, when we look at battery, expanding battery capacity, when we look at transitioning uh, the hydrogen hubs, that um, the public-private partnership around applying to federal funds for California to be a hydrogen hub, all of this rests on those partnerships. And I would say that it's an art, not a science. I would say that being nimble and flexible is important, but not so nimble that somehow that takes away the power of uh, the rules that we have set out to achieve. Um, and, uh, and I think it's this formula, along with maybe one other piece that I would put in there, which is our system of public higher education in our state, which provides the workforce of the future, which produces um, patents and produces uh, the, uh, uh, the, the academic research and the academics themselves, which bridge over into the private sector uh, to start these companies, which is supported by the fact that, that two times the amount of venture capital uh, that is uh, delivered in the country uh, for, for, for the rest of the country is, is, is um, available and, and uh, delivered into the private sector in the state of California. All those things together 
are what create the innovation ecosystem that has created the powerhouse that is California. And again, I don't mean to be on this soapbox. Governor Inslee <laughs> just, just kind of set me off. But, but the reason is, this isn't just sort of California pride for the sake of California pride. We have to tell the California story because there are a lot of people out there who are constantly degrading us and, and, and focused on the challenges we have. And there's no question we have challenges in the state around homelessness and, and uh, you know, lots of income inequality, a lot of issues. But we're doing this well and we're leading on this. And the people who are trying to undermine the efforts of all of you to change where energy comes from and pivot away from the fossil fuel industry, they're coming after us in California. And so it benefits all of us to really tell this California story uh, together and to, and to be proud of it. I just wanted to add that um, the rule of law also is a very, very critical in making sure that systems that the lieutenant governor is talking about are protected. And I just want to brag that a lot of our, uh, so any of you investors, um, our Guam laws, a lot of it is based on the California law. So you'd be able to operate rather um, good. But for us, right, being out there in the Western Pacific, right, we're the furthest U.S. soil from, in Asia. We're only three and a half hours on an airplane south of uh, Japan or from the Philippines. So we're really out there. And in, the, in this geopolitical space, I see that the rule of law and the availability of infrastructure um, is going to be a very attractive point for us to operate and to try and harness a lot of the investment and a lot of the innovation that's coming out of uh, the Asian subcontinent, especially those that are concerned with um, the recent, um, uh, I guess, the, for the last few years, the strong arm of the, of the entrepreneurs in China because of their government, and trying to find ways to figure out how we could utilize um, a lot of the innovation coming out of Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, applying it uh, in a space under the protection of U.S. law, I feel is the path forward for our territory and also being an innovation hub that can uh, that we can push out technologies, services, and programs to the rest of the region. I, I wanted to say that um, the the Pacific Island Forum, which is comprised of the Independent Pacific, have developed a 2050 Blue Pacific uh, Continent strategy. This strategy recognizes uh, climate change as number one the exist the existential threat but is meant to empower Pacific Islanders to act on these uh, and try and guide and navigate their ways dealing with uh, some of the countries that are causing um, the harm that we're seeing firsthand. And I, I wanted to use that as a bridge to recognize the state of California for their leadership. Remember, uh, during the Trump time, uh, when the U.S. withdrew from the Paris Accords, it was California and Washington and the others that decided to activate themselves, make sure that the state government and state law and state policy was continued to be focused on the change and innovation and urgency that we knew was requ required. And I say that because we're celebrating and we have so many opportunities because of the two um, landmark legislation that President Biden has passed but, you know, we can't predict what's going to happen in the election season next year. We might be in a situation where we're going to have to do it on our own again. But um, this organization, I think, and the folks in the room are the ones that are going to build the resilience from whatever potential change in policy may happen if, unfortunately, the majority chooses the wrong thing. And sometimes that happens. But um, the action that happens now, um, right now, especially the urgency that we need to apply within our governments, but with the partnership from the private sector, right? Procurement muddles us down. There's so many things that being in government is just such a, a debilitating situation. We don't have the latitude and the, um, the uh, robustness of private sector actors to try and push the envelope even past where we're thinking. 
And I think this is, in essence, what is, we need to really work so well right now together uh, to mitigate and make sure that no matter what happens in this next election season, we're going to continue to make big strides uh, because time isn't on our side, right? Exactly. So what I'm hearing um, between it, Governor Inslee's remarks and some remarks here today is we need to be competitive. That's good. But we also need to collaborate in order to move forward on climate action. We just have a few minutes left. Um, I would love to hear from our audience if there are if there are one or two quick questions. Uh, we've got some microphones. People could. Uh, hi, my question is for Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Uh, my name is Emmanuel. I'm a commissioner with LA County in our inaugural commission on youth and climate. And uh, I wanted to ask a question about uh, specifically something that I haven't heard in the conference, which is housing. Um, I know that, sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> uh, I know that CAR Padford's scoping plan, a 25% reduction in vehicle miles traveled by 2030. And one of the best ways that we can do that is by building more housing. Uh, I know I want to ask sort of how can California go further in built, developing more climate smart infill housing, whether that's uh, streamlining CEQA, whether that's uh, building housing in one of the many acres of parking lots that we own or in the parking spaces that we lease. Uh, how can sort of California go further in housing? Well, thank you very much for your question and for your service. Uh, let me just start by responding um, very briefly, Lieutenant Governor. I feel a California Guam alliance brewing Absolutely. right now, and um, here. Here. Uh, we may be separated by thousands of miles, but the as the sun sets off the California coast, it rises right. in Guam. So. Um, we can do more, and we should, uh, particularly with the point that you made about the potential for shifting in Washington and how strong, and Governor Inslee mentioned as well, how strong the subnational governments working together uh, can be. The other power that we have is our youth, and our youth, uh, the young people, the next generation. I have been blown away by the upcoming generation's commitment to action on climate change. Just blown away. Um, when I was growing up, I, I was, I'm not a baby boomer. They're a little ahead of me. But the baby boomers grew, had this, ask not what you can do what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And they went out and they became teachers and service and all of this. The answer to that question of ask not of your generation is we're going to, to address the issue of a warming climate. We're going to do something about it. And so let's just start by acknowledging, I'm sure in Guam, across the country, across the world, the incredible role of the upcoming generations in their commitment to this issue. Very true, very true. Um, in terms of housing in California, this is a whole kind of different approach uh, to dealing with the, uh, the issue at hand. Um, one thing that we are working very hard to do is um, is reducing emissions in the building sector, where it's housing, whether it's housing or um, commercial spaces. Uh, we have to reduce the amount of natural gas um, that's being used. We have to um, improve efficiencies in general. And, and that's going to be a big part of our challenge. But in terms of your specific question about vehicles mild traveled uh, reductions, uh, which is important, and in just building more housing close to where people are working, more density, um, reusing land that's already been used. All of this is very much a target, but it's not happening fast enough. It's just not. Uh, the median home price in California peaked last May 
at $900,000 for a single family home in our state, medium price across the entire state. At the same time, Texas and Florida were under $300,000 for, for a single family home. Uh, the pressure that it is putting on our system, you know, I mentioned the homeless challenge, um, but the affordability challenge, uh, the fact that people, um, if they can't afford a home in that range, they're going to be two hours away from Los Angeles and they're going to commute in, they're going to sleep in their cars. Um, this is unacceptable. So you see a whole flurry of legislation. I think that um, the legislature is at is is seriously mobilized. And, and by the way, this is my background. I built master plan communities up in the Sacramento region for 18 years before becoming a diplomat, before becoming an elected official. Um, there has never been more um, attention, focus, and intention around delivering more housing in the state. It is going to take a while to get there. There is tremendous pushback from people who don't want uh, it in their neighborhoods. There is uh, decades of infusing into our legal system the ability to stop projects. Uh, there is um, uh, a challenge in the workforce in terms of having enough skilled workers to be able to build it. So it's going to take us a while to get there. The intentionality is there, but this is a decades-long problem that is going to take much more in terms of effort and innovation to be able to resolve. Lieutenant Governor Tenorio, would you like to uh, respond to that and maybe that would be fi some final comments as well? Yeah, actually I was going to ask, uh, I was just curious what the other question was. Um, it's for you. <laughs> but uh, but I, I'll just say this, uh, you know, I, I, I just like the Lieutenant Governor here, um, the, um, the motivation and the commitment and the determination I see from um, the younger folks in our community is excellent. It really, um, I guess, borrowing from Governor Inslee, makes me confident that we're going to be able to navigate all the challenges that are coming. Um, but just to, just to bookmark, the average uh, median cost of a home on Guam is now $400,000, uh, exceeding um, uh, Texas and Florida, dominated because of this, uh, or influenced by a lack of skilled labor, but also because of a rapid uh, milita uh, militarization that is occurring in addition to effects of mass tourism. So um, our challenge is making sure that we don't um, uh, leave, our, leave our people in the situation that folks in, on Oahu find themselves with where the local indigenous population is starting to uh, uh, become alienated from the ability to home, own a home and raise a family. Uh, and if they're not able to do that, then the uniqueness that we have as an island is not going to survive, right? But the other thing, if we've been around for 4,000 years ago, I'm pretty sure that we can survive even this. But there are challenges uh, for sure. I feel that youth action is so necessary. It's the, it, it is the morality in the entire uh, movement. Um, this is every time that we do things, or more importantly, when we don't do things, just remembering um, and, and getting agitated sometimes from the youth voices is necessary for everybody to keep going forward. So I, congratulations on being named to be a commissioner. That's pretty cool. Uh, thank you, everybody. This panel has been amazing. I think we could go on and on with this conversation. We would love to, and we will be happy to support in any way the alliance between Guam and California and host another event, if we can make that happen. Yes. Um, th there it is. Yes, here it is. Um, please join me in thanking our guests today who talked about subnational action and <laughs> challenges and opportunities. Thank you so much.